So today we're going to be learning about associations, association learning, some connections to human cognition and animal cognition. One of the people we'll learn about is Edward Thorndike, who did some of the earliest research on animal cognition. He put animals like cats and dogs into these little puzzle boxes and tried to figure out if they could get out of the puzzle box, you know, learn how to escape from this little thing, and then run out and get some food. I don't have a puzzle box here, but uh, let's do something similar. Let's get a puzzle, put some food in it, and see if my cats can figure out how to get it out. All right, so the way this goes is I'm gonna put some piece of puzzle in there. Oh, sorry, treats be underneath these things, and then the cats have to get them out. And you can make it more difficult, like by closing these things off. Coco's here too, and let's see how they get on. I think actually they've done this so many times that it's pretty trivial for them to solve. There, I already got one. All right, let's let the cats play and head into the lecture where we will learn more about associations, and we'll actually take a look at some of this research on cats escaping out of puzzle boxes. See you soon. All right, we're back, and this is uh, the first part of a mini lecture for our, our uh, learning module on associations. We're going to be talking about uh, philosophy and early animal cognition, and the bridge between these things is associations. So let's get into it. As a reminder, read chapter five from the textbook. It covers this topic on associations. This mini lecture will skim over some of the ideas in that chapter, but there's more in the chapter than I'll get a chance to talk about here. Here's the set of four things I'm going to go over. I'm going to start off talking about some early philosophy and the school of associationism. This is a precursor to experimental psychology. Then we'll talk about some human research looking at associations in the late uh, 1800s, early 1900s. We'll take a look at Edward Thorndike's research on puzzle boxes with cats and dogs. And at, in the second part of this, we will talk about uh, Ivan Pavlov's classical conditioning research. So the textbook goes over a few different precursors, like historical movements uh, to experimental psychology. We'll focus today on philosophy and associationism, but there's precursors in natural science and uh, evolution, theory of evolution. So with respect to philosophy, for many centuries, let's say, well before psychology was an established discipline, questions about cognition were being posed by philosophers. And I'm sure questions about cognition were being posed by lots of different people. Uh, we're going to look at a particular tradition in uh, Western European philosophy that is a precursor for uh, a lot of experimental psychology in the early 1900s. So one of the general areas of philosophy we'll be talking about is epistemology. This is the branch of philosophy concerned with knowledge. So asking questions like, what is knowledge and how do we know something? These sound like philosophical questions and they also sound like psychological questions. There's lots of different perspectives on answers to these questions. One school of thought was and is, I suppose, uh, rationalism. And this is the idea that knowledge is derived from logic and reason. I've listed here a few rationalist philosophers you can check out, Rene Descartes, Baruch Spinoza, and Gottfried Leibniz. We'll talk a little bit about Rene Descartes in the next chapter, I believe. Let me give you an example of the kind of flair of rationalism, see if this works. So I've got a glass here uh, and it's got some ginger water in it. So how do I know this is a glass with ginger water in it? I mean, one answer I would give you is I would just look at it and I know, I know because I put the ginger water in there, so that's how I know. That would fit uh, better with empiricism, which we'll talk about in a moment. With rationalism, uh, how do I know that kind of thing? Maybe that's not the best example, uh, but a rationalist might want to say, okay, the way I know these things to be true could be I mean, through formal argument. I would have to come up with a series of premises that I could reason through and logically prove somehow, 
uh, something to be true. So if I could figure out a way to formally make an argument to prove that this is a glass of uh, ginger water, then potentially, according to a rationalist, I could have uh, knowledge about what that thing is. Sort of in contrast to this formal system of knowing is a school of philosophy called empiricism. And this school emphasizes a role for observation and evidence collection in knowledge creation. So how do I know this is a pencil? I look at it, I can see that it's a pencil. People told me these things are pencils. I've learned that through observation in my life. And that's how I know that thing is a pencil. The empiricist school of philosophy suggests that uh, people can acquire knowledge about their environment through their sense organs and not necessarily through formal logical reasoning processes. This kind of idea invites questions that are a lot like the modern questions of cognition. These are questions about the process of how knowledge acquisition works. How is it that I can look at something receive light information into my eyeballs and then be able to recognize that this is a pencil and be able to tell you that I know that it's a pencil. What is that process? How does it work? Let's go back to the associationist school. These were empiricist philosophers and they began speculating on the nature of these mental processes that could possibly produce knowledge from experience. Here's one example, philosopher John Locke. He discusses the association of ideas as a non-rational process in uh, this work, an essay concerning human understanding. So he suggests that some associations are natural and good and maintained by reasoning, but also that people have these arbitrary associations that can depend on a person's history of experience. So for example, here's a Lionel Richie record, and I've got associations with uh, Lionel Richie. We, we all might, if you know who this is, and I say the name of a music artist that you are familiar with, you might bring to mind some songs that you've heard them sing before. At, and at the same time, you probably have some arbitrary associations that have to do with your own personal history, let's say, of experiencing something that was happening in your life while you were listening to a particular song. So I've got particular experiences that happened in my life when I listened to Lionel Richie, and I've got associations with those things. So they're totally arbitrary. Uh, they're not necessarily uh, natural and good and entirely rational. They're just things that happened when I was listening to Lionel Richie. And so John Locke is talking about these things in the, in, you know, the six, from 1632 to 1704. That was the time period of his life. And he's starting to think about how these associations work. Because if it's, if, if the way you know things isn't by formally reasoning through stuff, and, and you could know something by association just because it happened to you, it's, it's a curious question. How do these associative processes work? Here's some uh, text right from his essay. And let's see if I can highlight a part where it illustrates some of his thinking. Okay, so he's actually talking about how thinking works. And let's see what he says. As far as we can comprehend thinking, ideas seem to be produced in our minds, or if they are not, this may serve to explain their following one another in a habitual train when once they are put into their track as well as it does to explain such motions of the body. Uh, a musician used to any one tune will find that let it begin in their head, the ideas of the several notes of it will follow one another orderly without any care of attention. And so on. If you want to read more from this uh, essay, you can click this link and that will take you to archive.org. Um, once in a while, I'll, I'll make these links available. You can see it's pretty long. It's 694 pages. 
and here's the table of contents. If, it, it's kind of hard to zoom in here, but if we start in book two, he's talking about of ideas in general and their origin. And he's talking about senses and vision and audition and all sorts of stuff, the power of words and knowledge and opinion. It almost reads like some of the sections of a cognitive psychology textbook. And I'm bringing this up as an example of uh, people before formal experimental psychology was occurring, speculating on how cognitive processes work. Now, one of the things the philosophers of association did was they proposed principles. These are things they thought potentially influenced the formation of associations. Here's one example, the principle of contiguity. This states that the strength of association depends on the proximity of events in space and time. Events that are closer to each other are more strongly associated to each other. This was an idea they thought maybe that makes sense. So if I try to uh, associate two things right now, just to illustrate the principle, let's say this is a paintbrush and this is a, a 45 record. I'm showing them to you at the same time. They're close together. So they're close together in space and time. And uh, now maybe if I show you this paintbrush and ask you, what was the other thing? You'd be able to say, well, it was a record and you have a strong association because these things were presented together. I could also do something like I could present this book to you over here. I could wait a while and then in a far away place, I could present this uh, screwdriver. And because those things happened in different spatial locations and they didn't happen at the same time, you might not have formed as strong an association between those events. I mean, that would be according to the principle of contiguity. Another principle is that of similarity. This is the idea that how similar two things are will determine how strong an of association there is between those things. Next is the principle of frequency. This is the idea that when things happen together many times, the more pairings, the more frequently the pairings occur, the more association will happen between those two things. So for example, let's take the letter Q. Think about the letter Q. You've seen that before. What letter typically comes after the letter Q? And hopefully you're thinking the letter U. So if I say Q, you think U. That's because Q's and U's, you know, in English happen a lot together. It might be more difficult to think about a different letter following Q, even though it might happen once in a while. The recency principle is that stronger associations uh, will occur for more recently paired events in time compared to more remote events. It's a little bit like the principle of contiguity for time. Now we can look at these principles and think, yeah, no, maybe that they all seem kind of reasonable. You could probably bring to mind some examples in your own life where, you know, how often or far apart things were it seems to influence your association for something. But these are just claims about how associations might work. And one of the things that early experimental psychologists and up till today, cognitive psychologists are interested in doing is putting these claims to the test. One thing that's nice about these associationist claims are that they are specific enough that they can be evaluated with evidence. So we could use the scientific method to assess claims about associations and cognition. Here's some basic claims you could try to assess. One, people have associations between concepts. Two, New associations can be learned. And three, some associations are stronger than others. These might not seem uh, like claims that really need a lot of evidence. You could probably think about times when you learned a new association or an example where an association between one thing and another seems to be really strong compared to another one that doesn't seem as strong. So because you can bring up your own examples, you might think, well, I've got evidence that some of these claims seem pretty legit. Well, in, let's say the 1900s, early 1900s, um, 
Gathering evidence for these kinds of basic claims was one of the tasks that experimental psychologies were setting for themselves. So let's take a look at uh, some of that early work. We're going to go back and look at James McKean Cattell again. He, we met him earlier. He was an, an early mental tester, but he was also interested in experimental psychology research, and he had a general goal of using experiments to test theories of cognitive processes, especially those related to the formation of associations. A lot of his research involved mental chronometry. We'll uh, see many examples throughout the course of this. Mental chronometry is a fancy way of saying measuring the amount of time necessary to complete a task or mental operation. So let's look at some of Cattell's work from 1886 on naming time. Here's a paper titled The Time It Takes to See and Name Objects. It was published in a journal called Mind. We're going to review what his basic questions were, what his methods were, and what were the results? What did he find? If you're wondering what a paper from 1886 looks like, here it is, the time it takes to see and name objects. It's only three pages long. Now let's briefly talk about what he did. It's right here. He says, I pasted letters on a revolving drum, a physiological chymograph, and determined at what rate they could be read aloud as they passed by a slit in a screen. So he was trying to measure, if I show you a letter, how long does it take between the time I showed you the letter and you saw it and were able to identify it that entire time to name a letter? So rather than going through that paper in, in close detail, I'm just going to summarize it. Some of his big questions were how long does it take for a person to will or think something? What processes are occurring during the temporal interval? And more specifically, how long does it take to see and name an object like a color or a letter. I mentioned this thing called a physiological chymograph. This is what that looks like from 1840. And it's a revolving drum with a little lever on it. It can make these little waves. So what Cattell did is he basically hacked this little instrument and put uh, a slit in that drum in a way such that when it spun around, you could see something like a letter visually presented to you for a brief period of time. And, and using this machine, he could figure out pretty closely uh, when he showed you the letter, and he could measure the temporal interval from when you made a response being able to identify that letter. Here are some of his basic results. Participants took about 200 to 333 milliseconds to read each letter. And that's how long it took them when the opening was one centimeters. You could do things like change the opening so you get to see more. And uh, what happened then was letter naming speed got faster. So if you could see more letters, then you're able to identify a specific letter faster. So Cattell was collecting Kind of interesting factoids about all this stuff. Check this out as a conclusion or just as a comment. Of the nine people he experimented on, four could read the letters faster. Four of these people, uh, when there was five letters in view at once, but if there was six letters in view at once, they weren't uh, helped by that. It's interesting. So why are you faster to identify a single letter uh, when there's other letters there. Some, something about the other letters are helping you identify the letter that you're looking at. It's kind of a curious observation. Here's another observation because he was also showing people things like colors. So he says, other experiments I've made show that we can recognize a single color or a picture in a slightly shorter time than a word or letter. But takes longer to name it. So just to me, sorry, I should repeat that. You can recognize a color quickly, but it takes you longer to name what color it is compared to a letter. And, you know, you start wondering, well, why would it take me longer to recognize and name some things like colors versus other things like letters? And he starts proposing 
uh, ideas like this. The idea based on uh, the principle of frequency here. He suggests that people have spent a lot of time looking at letters and naming them, and it's become very automatic. And so you don't even have to think about it because you've done it so much. However, in the case of looking at colors and naming them, that's something you can do, but because you haven't practiced it so much, for Cattell, this requires a, a voluntary effort in order to name the color. Now, we'll see in future uh, lectures that this idea of automatic processing, this idea of more effortful voluntary processing, remain modern ideas, in, certainly in the field of attention. In this example, Cattell was presenting somebody a stimulus and measuring how long it took them to name the, the stimulus. So the association time there was about seeing and naming. These weren't the only associations he was interested in. Another example is his work on the associations between ideas. And this was published in 1887, also in the journal Mind. Some big questions here are, how are concepts formed without words? What mental processes take place when an object is named? Are there differences when using a familiar or second language? And here's some more specific questions. How long does it take to recall an association? And I think I got this next part wrong. And it says here, such as naming, saying the name of an object. Um, I should go and change that. Uh, the more specific question is, how long does it take to recall associations between ideas? Let's take a look at some of his methods and results. And we can zoom in here and see that, uh, an example of the task. The task was essentially measuring how long it took people to remember certain kinds of facts. B and C, they refer to two different people who did this task. And here's what happened. Cattell would present, for example, a well-known city name. And the participant would have to name the country in which the city is situated. So maybe the city would be Paris and the answer would be France or the city might be Toronto, and the country would be Canada. Here's a little table of results. These are the, the times for B, and it doesn't really say which cities and countries are, are ones we're looking at, but um, this would be an example of, it took this person 348 milliseconds to name a particular country given a particular city. For a different pair, this might be a more familiar association, they only took 53 milliseconds. So if we look at these four numbers, we see sometimes it takes a person a little bit longer, sometimes a little bit shorter, dep probably depending on what the specific cities and countries were. And for person C, we also see that um, Sometimes they're a little faster, sometimes they're a little slower. Now, Cattell was interested in just trying a bunch of stuff and measuring different things. So he had people give uh, recall facts having to do with months and seasons, or how about I give you a month and you have to say what the next month is, or I give you a month, you have to say what the preceding month was, I'll give you the name of an author, and you have to say what language they wrote in, and so on, or I'll give you some numbers to add or give you some numbers to multiply. And all of these tables just show the time it took for people to recall these basic facts for these different categories of facts. All right, one of the reasons I'm bringing up this really old research is, is to uh, go over some of the themes that were going on motivating these, this kind of measurement. And Cattell writes, memory is no transcendental process outside of space and time. This paper shows just how much time it takes to remember, and we have every reason to believe that the time passes while certain changes in the brain call forth other changes. So as a summary so far, we've talked about how associationist ideas from philosophy 
provided some starting points for theorizing about how cognition works. And we've looked at an, ex an experimental psychologist from the early 1900s who conducted experiments to measure association formation processes in people. What we're about to transition to is uh, how association learning research uh, was very soon applied to non-human animals. And to do that, we'll be talking about Thorndike's puzzle boxes. This is the last piece for this mini lecture, and we'll take a break and go on to Pavlov's classical conditioning in a different mini lecture. So let's talk about human and animal cognition. I mean, humans are animals, and they have cognition, and animals are animals, and they have cognition. And here's two different kinds of animals doing stuff that makes us think, wow, how, how are they doing these things? This uh, bird is pretty good at that tower problem, and those two kids are pretty good at getting out of their beds and playing around. So, of course, human cognition has been uh, a big area of research in psychology, but animal cognition is also a big area of research. Edward Thorndike pictured here was a student of Cattell, and he was one of the first psychologists to apply experimental lab techniques to ask questions about association learning in animals. He later started focusing on educational psychology, and although we won't go into it here, it's worth pointing out that he, he was also a leader in the eugenics movement, and that provides some context for why he was interested in animal cognition. So he published his first work on animal intelligence in a doctoral thesis. It was titled Animal Intelligence, an Experimental Study of the Associative Processes in animals. And you can go ahead and get a copy of that and read through it. It's pretty interesting. This was in 1898. I alluded to Thorndike's puzzle box research in the clip at the beginning. Essentially what he did was he made escape rooms for animals. This is a example escape room. Think of it like a little box and it's got a door on it and it's got, you know, contraptions everywhere. And here's what he did. He had spent a lot of time investigating how cats, dogs, and chicks learn to escape from these puzzle box contraptions. So he'd put a cat in there or a dog or a chick and see if they could get out. What's more important though is how Thorndike attempted to connect questions about how associations work, questions about what's going on with animal cognition, to his measurements in what he attempted to make, or, uh, what he had, to his measurements in the laboratory, and what he was attempting to do was create well-controlled laboratory situations so that he could draw inferences about associative processes from his puzzle box experiments. Now, in previous lectures, I brought up the concept of subjective mental imagery and subjective mental experience. Uh, a common kind of question sometimes we all wonder about, or you might have asked yourself, or someone might have asked you, are questions like, is my blue your blue? Like when I look at stuff and I see something that's blue, is it the same way for you? You know, it, it's these kinds of questions that we just never really will know the answers to because it's difficult to equate subjective experiences. Well, Thorndike was interested in the subjective experience of animals, trying to figure out what's going on there. Here's a little snippet from his doctoral thesis. And in this statement, he sort of has some fun with language and he wonders about the subjective experience of animals. And he's focusing on kittens. So let me read this for a bit. He says, we say that the kitten associates the sound, here kitty kitty, you know, with the experience of something like nice milk to drink is, is on its way, or it, um, he, he, he's sort of wondering like, yeah, when the kitten hears that sound, what's going on? Is it, uh, I like, I like this sentence here. Does the kitten feel the memory image of milk in a saucer in the kitchen? The, does he or she think of running into the house and feeling Finally, I'm going to run into the house and get that milk. What Thorndike is getting at is, is a kind of question like, is the cat mentally simulating a future scenario where they're going to go inside and get some milk because they heard their name called? Or is, 
is it not really like that at all? Maybe the cat is not aware of the sound of its own name, but something uh, about the sound causes a, a set of reflexes to kick in, maybe learned reflexes, and, and, they, and sort of almost robotically the, the cat runs in and it's not really thinking about what's going to happen so much. Thorndike points out that at, at this time, and, it's, and still today, the word association, if you're thinking about you know, associations that animals might have between things, could cover a multitude of essentially different processes. And one of his goals in his doctoral thesis was to give a positive value and several different definite possibilities of the meaning. So the purpose for Thorndike of putting these animals in these little puzzle boxes was to test ideas about animal cognition. Here's another good quote to work through. Surely everyone must agree that no one now has a right to advance theories about what is in animals' minds or to deny previous theories unless they support their thesis by systematic and extended experiments. My own theories will doubtlessly be op opposed by many. And I sincerely hope they will, provided the denial is accompanied by actual experimental work. So what Thorndike is going to do is come up with some proposals about what might be going on in the mind of a cat when they see a puzzle box or hear a sound or do various things. And then he's going to try to collect some evidence to support or uh, disprove these ideas. So let's take a look at some examples. The first thing to mention is that uh, there were some really basic results throughout his doctoral thesis. First, animals could learn to escape from the boxes. Totally. They could totally do that. Also, animals got faster at escaping these boxes with practice. So these are some basic observations. And Thorndike had further questions. How were animals solving the problem? How were they getting faster? And what kinds of associations were involved? So let's say you're Thorndike and you've taken a cat just like Mr. Ernie Cactus that we met earlier and you put him in this box and, it, and, and the cat's been in the box multiple times. It's learned how to escape out of this box multiple times. And you're putting the cat in there, say, for the 10th time. Every single time it got out before, it got some food. So what is going on in the mind of this cat as it's being placed in the box for the 10th time? Is it sitting there thinking, oh, here we go again, this box. Well, I got, you know, I'm just going to take my time, but I know if I just do this and this and this, I can get out this door and I can go over there and I can eat some food. That's a kind of uh, rational uh, description of, of a human-like thought process that might be going on. That might explain what is, uh, what cognitive, what processes are occurring that enable the cat to get out of this puzzle box and go get some food. Thorndike was interested in alternative perspectives. So he, he considered possible stages of association such as these. And this is an example of Thorndike thinking about uh, breaking down in stages what might be going on with this cat in terms of their um, subjective experience. So perhaps they get put in the puzzle box and they have some sense impressions of the interior of the box. And they experience discomfort and, dis and a desire to get out. It's possible they have some type of mental representation while they're in the box that gets activated of uh, pulling a loop. And, you know, that's meant to say that there's some loop in there. If you pull it, uh, it will open a door, for example. It's the way to get out of the puzzle box. So imagine the cat is experiencing some type of uh, knowledge or simulation of, uh, or mental imagery, let's say, of grabbing this loop and pulling it. Uh, what happens next? Well, maybe they have uh, some kind of motivating energy or 
instruction to themselves to say, I will do that thing that I can imagine myself doing. And then they, there will be some kind of impulse, some internal impulse that will cause them to actually pull the loop. When they pull the loop, they will have a sense impression of oneself pulling the loop and seeing your paw in a particular place while you're pulling the loop and having the experience of your body being a particular way. That, you know, would leave the door to be open and then the cat would have the sense impression of going outside the door and probably wandering around to the bowl of food and eating the food and so on. I really like these 10 steps. This is a, almost like a fictional account of Thorndike thinking about possible steps that might be happening uh, as the cat escapes from the puzzle box. And within these uh, 10 steps, there's all sorts of individual questions. Like, is it true that cats have mental representations of actions they might want to commit? Uh, how, how does the impulse to do a particular action actually work? Where does that come from? I could go into more of these individual questions, um, but I'll just describe them this way as experimental questions. So Thorndike was interested in um, conducting experimental scenarios to test particular hypotheses about animal learning. What I've described up till now isn't much of an experiment. It's just, I got this box, there's a tricky way to get out. You put a cat in it, the cat gets out, and you notice that it did that. So there's no real independent variable. There's no manipulation of something, seeing what uh, happens in the different manipulations. But Thorndike did, did run experiments. Here's an example. How about imitation learning? Is this something that can occur? Here's a big question. Can animals learn how to escape a puzzle box by watching another animal escape. So Thorndike would have one group of animals learn how to get out of a puzzle box. He would measure how many times or how long it took them to get out. And those animals wouldn't have had any experience watching any other animals do the same thing. Another group of animals would get to watch a group learn how to get out of the puzzle box. So they've already seen some other cats get out. Now, if uh, they've seen another cat do it, will that help them if they went into the box themselves? The results that he found on imitation learning weren't very good for cats, dogs, and chicks. In his scenarios, they did not benefit from the opportunity to watch other animals do the task. Now, that's an interesting, to me, that's an interesting result. If you could find evidence for imitation learning, that would be suggestive about um, the kinds of representations that animals might be using in this context. Here's another um, general question that Thorndike had, and he used experimental methods to answer. It's about general concept learning. The question is, can animals generalize their learning? If they learn to escape from one box, do they show benefits when trying to escape from similar boxes? I'm not sure I mentioned this, but Thorndike created all sorts of different boxes. Some of them, you know, funny different trap doors and different loops and systems to get out. He did find evidence of positive transfer. That is, animals who learn to escape from uh, one puzzle box were faster at escaping from a new one if it was similar to the one they'd learned previously. So that's a result that requires some interpretation. What does that result actually um, say about what the animals have learned? What does it mean about the underlying cognitive processes involved? And here's an example of a distinction that Thorndike would make. One, one thing that's possible is that animals were learning general concepts. These could be somewhat abstract concepts about how to solve puzzle boxes. So, you know, for example, if an animal had learned that there's a loop to pull in one puzzle box and potentially a kind of a button thing to, to press in another puzzle box, those are two very different things to do to get out of the box. But maybe if they learn something very general and abstract, they'd have learned there's a trick somewhere here. Or there's a hidden way to get out of this puzzle box. And so they go around the puzzle box and try to find that thing. Alternatively, 
Thorndike like talked about the concept of incidental transfer. This is the idea that animals weren't learning very general abstract concepts about getting out of the puzzle box, but they were learning about specific details that happened to transfer well to other similar boxes. So maybe animals who learned how to pull a little loop to open a trap door would transfer well to boxes that had, I don't know, like a little lever that also required a similar action. But if the box required a very different type of um, solution to get out, um, the transfer might not work very well because the skills required are too far apart. They're not as similar. Thorndike used his puzzle box research to ask all sorts of different questions, including questions about the delicacy or permanence of associations. Um, so how fragile are associations once you've learned them? How long do they last after they've been formed? What about the complexity of associations? Thorndike was interested, I think, in measuring and ranking the intelligence of animals as a function of the complexity of associations that they could acquire. He was interested in how many associations animals can learn and can consider questions like, if an animal has a kind of uh, habitual behavior that it does all the time, could it, could it learn to override that behavior with new, um, with, uh, with new learning? So that's Edward Thorndike and his puzzle box research. We are just about to make a transition here. We haven't been talking a whole lot about physio uh, physiological issues, the brain and the wet work in cognition. And around the same time that Thorndike was doing his puzzle box research, another person famous for studying association processes in animals was Ivan Pavlov. And he was a contemporary of Thorndike. We're going to talk about Pavlov and Pavlovian conditioning in the next mini lecture. That's it for this one. We'll see you on the other side.